welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohn, and today is part two of an interview with cultural critic Camille Paglia. Camille Paglia is University Professor of Humanities and Media Studies at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. She's the author of the best selling Sexual Personae Art and Decadence from Nefertiti to Emily Dickinson, two collections of essays, Sex, Art, and American Culture, and Vamps and Tramps, and most recently, Break, Blow, Burn, Camille Paglia reads 43 of the world's best poems. In the first part of our conversation, Professor Paglia discussed her views on a variety of cultural and literary topics. In this second part, we'll concentrate on her new book, Break, Blow, Burn, just out in paperback, and on the state of poetry in general. Um, welcome back, Thank Camille. you very much, Paula. Um, as your subtitle suggests, your new book, contains close readings of 43 short poems. Um, some would say that this is an old-fashioned sort of critical study. Why did you want to write something like this, really a departure from your previous work? Could you tell us about the motivation behind this book? Well, when I was in college in the 1960s, poetry was at an absolute height of popularity. And there were so many readings on my, on my college campus in, in upstate New York. Um, there was a ferment around it. But step by step, over recent decades, poetry has gone to the margins. I, I think it's partly in academe because post-structuralism um, swept in, which, which works um, only on narrative, on, on the long forms of the novel. Mm. It, it does not work on poetry. So the, the, the poetry professors, when, when I was uh, into grad school in, at Yale in 68 to 72, the poetry professors were at the, at the peak of, of prestige, coast to coast. Uh, but now, it, they, they simply are the handmaidens of, you know, of theory. Yeah. I, I really felt that it was necessary to try to get uh, poetry back at the center of the academic curriculum, but, but this book is directed to the general audience. Um, the poetry is a flat market. It, it is, it is it's just a non-starter. There, there, um, there's no buzz about it at all, uh, no money to be made in it. Uh, lines of poetry books have been dropped from the major publishers, um, and it was, a, it was a risk to, to, to do this. I mean, obviously my, um, my advisors, my agents, so they, they would prefer I write some sort of a political um, manifesto. It, we're in a period of political screeds where um, mm -hmm. you, you, where you have like from the right, from the left. Uh, but I just felt that I should use whatever name recognition I have won over the last uh, 15 years or so in the cause of something you know, for, the, for the arts. Um, therefore, I, I, I wanted to write something um, to try to interest general readers again in poetry. And the fact that the book became an immediate bestseller uh, you know, I, I'm hoping it's going to be influential in the publishing industry to, to, to give poetry a second chance. But the thing is, um, I, I, it was a condition of me doing it that the poetry be presented in a way that was visually attractive to the general reader. Mm. Um, I think that the way poetry is uh, introduced far too often in large universities um, by means of gigantic uh, um, readers, like, like the Norton Anthology, which are, which are you know, produced by very erudite people, and, and these things are wonderful resources to have, very encyclopedic, but is this the ideal way to introduce poetry to people who, um, who need kind of you know, cultivation in, in literature? Gigantic, yeah. heavy, <laughs> burdensome books I, like I, a rock. I couldn't agree with you more. Yes. I really, I, I often choose a book based on the size and the price yes. in terms of teaching. Mm -hmm. And yes, this is, I'll just show this to it's the camera. It's supposed to be a handy size. And okay. lovely pink and, cover. And yeah. each poem, it, it, what, the condition, of, again, of the book for me, is that each poem had given it space to breathe. It allowed yeah. its own page. The running together of poems and anthologies, I think, is very disrespectful to, to great literature. And, and it produces a fatigue of the eye, I mean, and, and, and a lack of honoring of you know, the genius that, that produced these works. So I wanted, the, I, I wanted the general reader to see the poem almost as if it's a, a painting hanging on a wall, uh -huh. okay? hanging there, hovering in the white space. Okay? And, and, and I, I say, it, this is the silence out of which the words of the poem emerge. Okay. Well, it is interesting, though. You've chosen 43 poems, and I want you to address that. I wonder if there was any kind of quirky uh, mm -hmm. uh, idea there going on mm -hmm. with your choice of 43, as opposed to 45 no. or 50. You just, I I those were the 40, only ones no, you could. And my, and it, the, in fact, the editor, you know, the publisher, you know, uh, said, to, said to me long afterward, they said, we, when you, you know, produce 43, they said, they said, should we ask her to either go down to 40 or go up to 50? And they said, it seems kind of 
rod, and they said, no. They said she found 43. There's a, there's a kind of like, you know. Well, it's a, neat that it's an 43. An experimental yeah. improv thing to it. These are the 43. Okay? Right. It feels right to me. And then here it is. Yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. kind of quirky, so it's yeah. nice. Also, the poems are short. And mm -hmm. this, I think, is interesting, too, from the point of view of not intimidating the reader and from the point of view of teaching. As a teacher myself, mm -hmm. I will say that there is something to be said for teaching a short poem. Right. Uh, you get in, you get out. Mm -hmm. There is, you can spend a lot of time, but there isn't too much verbiage right. to deal with. And I wonder if you were thinking about that, if these are poems that you have taught. Yes, I, the, the first half of the book especially, going from Shakespeare right down into the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, these are poems that have worked for me over time in the classroom, dealing with students who don't want to be there. I, I, I am not someone who teaches at one of the elite Ivy League universities where you get uh, products of the prep schools who know how to read a poem and know how to write a paper, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm dealing with, um, essentially, it's a, a vocational school at the University of the Arts. People come to my school already knowing what they want to do, um, and, and the liberal arts courses are service courses. I mean, and, and most of the kids are taking them begrudgingly. Uh, it, it, they, it, it's not as if they not, may not be interested in, you know, in an ideal sense. It's that they are overwhelmed with their, with their responsibilities to their major. That's their priority, okay, because it's, it's, it's job-oriented to them. Therefore, I learned over time what works in the classroom and what does not work in the classroom, and these poems really work. The fact that they are so small, exactly, it allows even students who don't like poetry to say, mm. um, to say oh, I, I can manage this. It, 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 makes, it, gives, it makes poetry have a recognizable shape, okay? And, it, and, and you, can, you, can, you can really treat the poem exhaustively. But then, uh, it, the problem yeah. for me, I thought it would be easy to write the book. Yeah. Okay, because I had, I had, I had written, you know, done these poems so often. Shock, okay? Shock. When I actually came to write it, I realized that, of course, in the classroom, we're all looking at the poem. Now, in this book, the reader is going to read the poem and then move to the commentary. Right. The poem is no longer in front of the reader's eyes. That's why the book took five years to write. Five years. And I went over deadline for deadline. I have a very understanding publisher. Um, and uh, it took three years to write the book and then two years alone just for the prose. That's all I did was to try to make the prose accessible and lucid to the general reader. To try to keep the idea of the poem in mind as you're reading the commentary. Mm. So I had to recreate the atmosphere of the poem. I had There's to find the right words. There's a definite art to that. You're right. Yes. And I, it really is artfully done. Yeah. In, in, a, in a way <laughs> it, that I hope it's not even obvious how much work went into it. So it just seems so easy easy and natural that you don't even realize the heavy labor and the heavy lifting that went into it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you were very successful. Thank I you. wanted to um, read the first four lines of the uh, poem from which the title of the book comes, and I think it's so typical of you, Camille, mm -hmm. that you have a title, Break, Blow, Burn, which is such a, you know, like in your face sort of, and yet, where does this, this come from? It comes from a John Donne poem written mm -hmm. around 1600 or so, I guess, Holy Sonnet number 14. I mean, you just wouldn't think that that title would come from that poem. Isn't and I it think amazing? That that, it's amazing. It, that, that, in fact, expresses the whole point of the book. Okay? Yeah. Here is a line written in the 17th century mm. that sounds like it, it was produced by an ad agency yes. yesterday. I mean, break, blow, burn. I mean, it's, 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 so, it's so emphatic. Yeah, exactly. So in your face, exactly yeah. what you say. I mean, it, it has the, the tautness you know, and the tension of modern media. And I'm saying, look. You Almost know, too much. I, at first, I saw this title, and I thought, my God, she's going overboard. And then I realized it's from it's John Dunn. Sonnet number yes. holy son, a holy son. Yeah. So let me read the first four mm -hmm. lines, and then I'd wish you would comment yeah. a bit, okay? Uh, and the first line, I guess, is very uh, famous for those who have studied some poetry. Uh, Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet, but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. Well, this poem belongs to um, Dunn's later religious poetry. He had a very, very uh, sexual uh, um, poems in, early in his career. And in this one, he is appealing to God to, uh, to rape him, uh, literally to... The, it's the, amazingly the, sexual yeah, poem. Amazingly. And, he, yeah. and Dunn, a very virile man, has projected himself in, into, the, into the persona of, of a woman who is almost a, a virgin who needs to be, needs to be attacked and the, the doors of the heart need to be broken down. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's an extraordinarily power. The rhythm, rhythms of it are, are 
are um, a shocking poem. It, it's it's shocking. It, it yeah. was, it, the thing is that in that period, of course, um, at the time of the late Renaissance and, and and the Baroque, there was a kind of intermixture that was possible between religious and sexual language that would be um, very con much more controversial today. I mean, that's you have you know Bernini's mm. famous statue of Saint Teresa right. of Avila fainting and having an orgasm, but also having a, you know a moment of, of, of spiritual uh, uh, insight and spiritual union with with God. We we've lost that today. I mean, a, a poem like that today would would be um, would be attacked okay by by uh, conservative Christians. Nobody's attacked you on this poem. Uh, no, I mean, in, in, the, in the book I also have tried to find, have a mix of mm -hmm. religious poetry with radical leftist poetry like that of William Blake, um, a, a be, you know, a bohemian poetry you know, at the very end, uh, some you know, overtly gay or, or, you know, or, or this one that's um, Paul Blackburn's poem, the once over about a whole car off subway rider staring at a beautiful girl in a, in, mm -hmm. in a dress. Um, and and I, I, what I'm trying to do is bridge the gap between audiences in the United States. I think that the, the, the pernicious thing about post-structuralism and about so many of these of, of you know the, of the identity politics that, that got into academia is that um, academia moved so heavily to the left that young people don't are not taught any longer how to appreciate religious poetry. Now I'm an atheist, but I have a great respect for religion, for the world religions. I feel that that uh, every great religion is a symbol system okay, that that um, tells us about the relationship between humanity and the cosmos. So there's a spiritual dimension to it. I sometimes call myself a new age crit critic in that sense. That I'm I'm influenced by the 1960s, um, and I have a kind of multicultural perspective that is not that uh, it's not a, based on the quota system and making a making a, a reading list that, that that is fair to everyone, but rather that has this um, kind of you know, it's almost like a, a kind of form of nature worship. I'm, I'm very interested in tribal cultures and you other, respect other, various systems. Yes, I guess. other yeah. systems, right? And I and I. I I am a kind of religious thinker, but an, but an atheist. Right? Right. So I feel that without respect for religion, okay, no one can possibly appreciate all the greatest works of art that have been produced by every major culture. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that is that is what's wrong right, with academia right now. That it's spiritually hollow. That the politicization of academia is wrong because what it's done is is make uh, is push religion to the side when in fact r religion and the arts have been intricately involved okay, since the beginning of time. Mm. Okay. Well, how definitive do you think your readings are? This whole notion of a, a definitive reading mm -hmm. of a poem. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that you have really tried to get at what these poems are about and you feel satisfied that you, your reading has done that? I mean, you're bringing to bear, you have a classical background mm -hmm. as well as this enormous knowledge of popular culture. But, um, so you're bringing to bear these personalized references in, in your background. Mm -hmm. do, do you ever feel somehow limited by what you know or the way you think in terms of what you bring to bear in reading a poem? Well, every reading is merely an interpretation. Okay? Mm. It's, it's, it is a point of view, and um, it's always partial. There's no way any reading can be fully complete. Okay? But I have tried, and that's why it took five years to the book, to the great poems, especially in here, I've tried to be as complete as possible, okay? to allow for you know, the, the, the full um, range of at least major meanings that are in there. But surely, I, I mean, I have a, an individual point of view. You know, there's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, about it that, that it can be, you know, rather idiosyncratic. Okay, that, um, that that people you know, might disagree the way. Um, I I thought that I had in writing the book. Um, sort of soft pedaled my interest in sex. I, I, I didn't want to. Um, to make the book unusable for young people, I, w I wanted this book to be given to uh, by parents to young people. Like I would, so, the book I would have wanted to get in middle school, yeah, and so yeah. I was really very bemused to see so many of the reviews. As, as usual, Polly sees sex everywhere. Oh, I didn't and, see that I, at all. I know it's amazing. Yeah. People objected to, um, for example, my my reading of. Um, of the George Herbert poem, uh, which is uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, sonnets, "Love Three," uh, and said that I had I had put sex into it that wasn't there, and I think I think, whoa, boy, are you are you they crazy? They haven't read that poem. Or you haven't read that poem, of course not. So I was yeah. amazed that you know, people people still found it there. Okay, and I, I tr and I tried I tried to have nothing overtly pornographic, and I tried to find phrasings, okay, that could pass. I mean, the only place, there's only one place, you know, at the end where, um, a gay poem where I say that a motorcycle cop twisting the, twisting the, um, you know, the, the throttle of, of his, of his motorcycle is, is, it's a castrating caress, okay, that, that's as close as I come, you're going to, to, um, to anything. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah. um, I, but certainly the, I, I try to, 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 portray, to, to show the erotics, you know, of, of literature that are in there, and there are certain places you can't avoid it, as in Walt Whitman, you know, and other Things I mean, it's just absolutely there, overtly, you know, blatantly there. Um, no, but I don't, I don't think any reading can ever fully exhaust a major work of art. Now, something like 
Coleridge's uh, uh, Kubla Khan, I worked on that poem to try to understand it for 30 years, taught it again and again in the classroom, and so many things in it were mysterious to me. And I finally, I finally feel I have produced in, in this book, okay, a complete reading of that poem. It's, it's of course, it is my version. It's simply a hypothesis. But you feel satisfied. I'm satisfied yeah. with it. But it took yeah. 30 years hmm. before I explained uh, things to myself 